Hi, Hi, everybody. I'm Hillary Iskin. I am an extremely recent graduate of this program. Um, it is a pleasure to see so many familiar faces. I've, I've worked with many of you, and it's, um, it's great to see you today. Um, and I have here with us Dr. Tracy Ty Lee, who is one of our expert endocrinologists. Um, I'll just get, I'll briefly introduce her and then she can add anything she'd like to. Um, Dr. Ty Lee herself attended the UW School of Medicine and then went to UC San Diego for her internal medicine residency. She came back here to the University of Washington for her endocrinology fellowship, and she is now a board certified endocrinologist and a UW assistant professor, working primarily out of Harborview. Um, that is that is me. I'm also the program director for our fellowship, and I am um, very interested in thyroid disease and thyroid nodules, and you can get me to talk about that stuff ad nauseum. So um, <laughs> if you ever have any thyroid questions or uh, want to get in on some biopsies, let me know. I, I'm, I'm your connection there. So great. That's good to know. Um, all right, and I'm hoping everyone can see my screen and hear me okay, send a chat or something if there's an issue, John's giving the thumbs up. Um, so I know that this is our first mix up session of the year, so I'll explain a little bit about what that is. Um, so mix up stands for the Medical Knowledge Self-Assessment Program. And it is a board prep tool that is produced by the American College of Physicians just like uh, the, the step one, step two, step three board prep software that you may have used in the past. And it's meant to be preparation for the ABIM internal medicine board exam, which you'll take, most of you will take at the, after you complete your third year of residency. So I graduated in June and I just took the boards in August. I'm now in the three month period where I'm waiting for my test results. Um, so the goal, let me, let's jump into our slides here. Um, just to start off, neither of us here today have any conflicts of interest. Um, and our learning goals today, the, the sort of hidden curriculum is to help you become familiar with the MixApp board question format, explore a little bit of the idiosyncrasies of these. But the real main learning goal today is to learn some endocrinology. And to that end, um, it's helpful if you guys are willing and comfortable to put on your videos. I There's no judgment if you're in your pajamas, been there, done that. Um, and if you're, I'd love to have participation. I know many of you, I, I, I'll try not to call on people, but it will help a lot if we are able to get some discussion going. I know Deli is gonna wanna jump in with, with and add his pearl, so. All right, um, so what we'll do is we will briefly go through the questions that you guys just had a chance to look over. Javel has set up some polls for us so we can get a sense of, we can take your temperature where everybody is, what your comfort level is with these topics. And then we'll talk about the answers with Dr. Tiley. Any questions so far? Okay, and Javel is gonna help me stay honest in terms of time and other folks will help me with the chat if needed. Okay. All right, so here's question number one. I am gonna choose not to read this out loud, but I'll let you review it briefly. And then we're gonna flip over to the answer questions here. If we could get our first poll up, that would be great. And then let me know if you guys want me to hop back over to the question stem at any point. Give about 30 seconds here. Anybody want to see the question stem again? And thanks to you having your cameras on, I can see you're shaking your head no, which is so helpful to me. All right, I think most of the folks seem to have answered. So I'm going to go ahead and end the poll. Sounds great. And then share results. OK. Interesting, we have a nice spread. So two thirds of you would vote to stop the risperidone and the other approximately third of you would obtain a pituitary MRI. And you guys actually did better than the majority of MixApp respondents, only 20% of whom selected the what, what MixApp would say is the right answer. Um, those, of you, those of you who chose answer 
um, E, would you be will anyone be willing to speak to that? Remember, that was the majority of you. Totally, I'll I'll answer that. Uh, up Thanks, to date, John. Yeah, you're welcome. Up to date actually kind of mentions that, um, uh, and I'm just kind of reviewing this now really quickly. That uh, looks like those antipsychotics can uh, elevate prolactin concentration pretty high. So our thought was maybe just change that medication, repeat it later, see if it goes down, given the fact that maybe since all of our other hormones were looking fine. Right. It was obviously wrong, but we tried. <laughs> and I think that, and I could, I think I chose that answer myself actually when I was doing this question the first time. Um, oops, there we go. Um, and I, one, one primary care pearl from me is that I've actually had patients like this. I get patients in front of me in clinic and the idea of stopping their antipsychotic is like, oh no, no, no. Everything else here is going to get thrown off if I do that. Um, so then I end up looking for some other way to rule out big, bad, scary things. Um, Dr. Tiley, what are your thoughts on this question? Um, can you go back to the question stem real quick? Yeah. So, uh, oh, so it's at the top. So her prolactin level. So this is the big key here. You're rarely going to get prolactin levels over 100 due to medications. So the fact that it's 220 suggests very strongly that she has a macroprolactinoma. You don't usually get other hormone deficiencies with prolactinoma, just suppression of the gonadotropins. So you'll have amenorrhea um, is the primary presenting factor hypogonadism in males. But um, the fact that this is that high, you have to get an MRI. Even if she's on risperidone, it could be risperidone, but you have to make sure that there's not a prolactinoma because that is going to be treated very differently. And I agree with Hillary. I will do not stop anyone's psychiatric medications without discussing with their um, providers because there's very easy ways to manage uh, prolactin um, that do not involve changing your antipsychotic medications. So um, I would definitely get an MRI first. If nothing shows up on the MRI, then it would be possible that it's medication, but usually the medication levels are less than 100. So you have to consider both a prolactinoma and medication effect. You can't just assume it, it's the medication. If it were 20 or 30 or 40, it is most likely the medication. And in that case, you're not gonna need to get an MRI, but you may not wanna stop the medication. You may just wanna put her on oral contraceptives. Nice. Very good. Yeah. So, and I put a picture here on the next slide, looking to see here this, now this one is a micro prolactinoma. This is an image I stole from BMJ, but this is exactly what we're looking for. Um, when I have patients like this in clinic, I try to screen them briefly, you know, are they having any visual field deficits? Are they having any galactorrhea, any of those sort of other symptoms? But um, once you have that prolactin level, the learning point here is uh, it's key to look at the magnitude of that prolactin elevation. And I will say, usually, even if they're on risperidone, if the prolactin's around 100, I may still get an MRI to look for a non-functioning adenoma because you'd really hate to miss that. Um, so if it's a non-functioning adenoma, you can get slight elevations in prolactin, similar to levels that you would get with medication effect. So while it may not be the right answer on the board, it's always going to be the right answer in clinic to get an MRI. Gotcha. All right. I, I think Dr. Tiley may have frozen. Um, but um, anybody else have any questions or comments? And, you know, Dr. John, you're welcome to jump in at any time if you also have primary care for all. No, nope, sounds good. All right. Let's move on to our next question. Um, and again, I'm, I'm not going to read this one, but I'll let you guys take a look at it. And then we can get our poll going. Um, I'm going to move over to the. Oops, did I do that? I'm going to move over to the answer slide. And if you guys, again, if you guys want to see the question stem again, just let me know.
And Javel, I think Dr. Tiley may be having trouble with her internet connection. I'm back. I got Yay. kicked off the internet. Sorry. I'm we gotcha. here <laughs> No worries. We're, 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 uh, they're doing their, they're putting in their answers to the second question here, which is, oops, you didn't see that. <laughs> <laughs> I know how to use PowerPoint. Okay, I think most people have answered. If you haven't yet, you can get it in under the wire. I'm going to go ahead and end the poll. Sounds good. All right. Excellent. Okay. Um, so we have a bit of a split here. Primarily, folks are answering um, D, which um, Ugh, I'm having a little PowerPoint trouble here. Um, yeah, there was, D is the correct answer on the um, initial set you sent out. It's not the correct answer on the current slide, I think. Okay. Because there was a, there was an E before. <laughs> okay, something got a little screwed up. Regardless, it seems like most people answered uh, D sliding scale only is that what pe people intended with answer D? Yeah. Okay. That, yeah. Well, that may have been answered before, but that is yeah not the right answer. Yeah. Ever. Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, and forty-four percent of mixed app respondents also put that answer choice. So you are not alone here. Um, anyone, anyone who put um, anyone who so, anyone who put sliding. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I was just say. So C is definitely the correct answer. D is definitely, or sliding scale is not the correct answer. I don't know what people were trying to answer, but that is, we'll go with that. Yeah. Um, if anyone who put the correct answer, basal and correction, if anyone's willing to speak to that a little bit. I was just listening to a podcast recently that was saying that we, very much under treat people for diabetes in the hospital or for hyperglycemia in the hospital while using the very reactive sliding scale insulin only. Um, so it's better to calculate the basal and then do correction on top of that. All right. Nice, Gina. And when you're doing your when you're doing your ad initial admission med rack at 11 p.m. and you're looking at all their orals, what do we what do we do with their oral antihyperglycemics? Well, I wrote it on the slide. We mostly hold them. Um, <laughs> um, and I also, I know it's, this is this is partly to prove that I'm not just primary care bias, but it's it's really easy when we're admitting patients into the hospital to just put everybody on sliding scale, but it doesn't do a great job of controlling their actual blood glucose. Maybe Dr. Tiley can teach us a little more about that. Yeah, it's exactly what Gina said. It's very reactive. So you're waiting for someone's blood sugar to get high and then you're correcting it. Whereas if you're the basal insulin, just you think about it, just holding everyone down a little bit. And if every anyone who has diabetes, especially if they're on insulin as an outpatient and often when they're on um, orals probably need some basal bolus. I think if someone's not on insulin as an outpatient and their diabetes is relatively well controlled, it's reasonable to watch them for a day or so just to see what their blood sugars do. But for people who have poorly controlled diabetes as an outpatient, it's very reasonable to start basal. And I usually start, I mean, you can start 10 units and you're going to be totally safe with just about anyone with type 2 diabetes. Um, you, I usually think about 0.2 units per kilogram as a starting dose, but then it makes me nervous. And so I decrease it to 10 units. Um, so there's, it's, it's really variable and it's a lot of trial and error, but as long as you start something, you at least, you're going to be better off than if you just do correction. It's fine to use correction with the meals, at least initially, because very often we don't know what people are going to be eating in the hospital. Um, 
Another thing you may notice is it's very, I always compare it to people who don't take their blood pressure medications as an outpatient. And when you admit them, you restart all of them and suddenly they become hypotensive. Same thing with insulin. You got to make sure they're actually taking their medications as prescribed as an outpatient before prescribing their, their insulin at full doses. Um, they usually eat a lot better in the hospital um, and it's a lot easier to control. So I, um, if someone has blood sugars that are above goal, you need to put them on insulin to bring them, them down. I think that goes to the question of, in a patient without diabetes, why would you um, uh, start insulin? Her blood sugars, I believe, were over goal. You want them to be, my goal is under 200. It's an easy number to remember. Um, so if blood sugars are consistently, um, yeah, so blood sugars have been elevated. And so um, the goal for inpatient uh, glycemia is typically to maintain the blood sugars between 140 and 180. And since you can't, you're not really going to start any oral agents on this, giving her a little bit of basal insulin would be adequate to bring those down. This is a patient where I might, I know I said sliding scale insulin is never the right answer on the boards, but in real life, you could do sliding scale insulin for a couple days and see how much she really needs. If she's only needing three or four units of correction, you're probably okay to stay on that. If she needs 10, 15, 20 units of correction, just give her that as basal. So that's another way of figuring out the basal is do correction for a few days and then add the basal. So there are the right answers for the boards and then there is the right answer in, in real life. So you absolutely can get stress hyperglycemia in the hospital, you absolutely, can get these hyperglycemic events that are gonna be short lived. But the question is, do we let her run in the 200s for three or four days, or do we just give her a little bit of insulin? Because we know that keeping blood sugars at least under 200 are associated with better outcomes. She doesn't need to be perfect. You don't need her blood sugars to be 100, but under 200 consistently would be a better option. So. I'd probably give her a day or two of correction and then convert that to basal if she was needing more than 10 units. That sounds great. Anybody have questions about that? We do a lot of blood sugar measurement and management in the hospital and it can get really complicated. Yes, sir, I just I had a question, I guess, about what outcomes are we looking at to sort of say that so, basal insulin yeah. keeping sugars less than 200 is good, or, yeah. Usually hospital, stay, um, like short duration of hospital stay is one that we look at. Um, it's complicated because the studies are just so varied. They look at patients in the ICU. And so you're looking at survival and a patient who's admitted with for IV antibiotics for hospital acquired pneumonia. It's not the same patient population that we've looked at. So there's actual some controversy over how tightly controlled we really should be keeping patients with diabetes. And this has been controversial for years. So the general teaching right now is under 180, but I, I will admit that the um, the outcomes for all patients are not that clear. So this is a, I mean, if her blood sugars were 300, it would be a lot easier question to answer. I think this is a tough one because those blood sugars are borderline and there is a higher risk of making her hypoglycemic if you throw her on a bunch of insulin that she's not gonna need two days from now. So um, the, in this actual case, I think it's not quite, it's not as straightforward. And I don't think you would be wrong to do correction for, like I said, for a few days. I don't think you'd be wrong to watch and see if her blood sugars improve as she gets better. I think the main teaching point for the boards would be if you do need to start insulin for someone in the hospital, don't start correction only because it's, it's reactive. You want, if someone needs insulin, do basal plus correction. But this case in particular, I think, is much more, you could do a lot of different things here and not be wrong. Looks like there's one other question in the chat and then um, John has his hand up. So the question in the chat um, from Natalia, is there a preference to give basal insulin in the morning versus PM? No, um, in the hospital, we usually just give it whenever is typical so that the nurses are able to work it into their routine. For patients, um, you know, the t we often recommend taking it at bedtime, and that I suppose is to suppress overnight 
um, hepatic glucose production, but it, it's a 24 hour insulin. So it's going to work no matter when you give it. So an outpatient, I give it to patients when they can remember. I have some patients who just fall asleep and forget to take their insulin. So I to take it as soon as they get up in the morning. It doesn't really matter. Um, it's whenever they can be most compliant with it. All right, John. Um, this is probably a good reminder. Um, mix up versus boards. Mix up questions are designed primarily for teaching purposes. Boards are high stakes questions to figure out whether you're allowed to practice or not. On the actual boards, you are unlikely to see something where there is a high degree of controversy or there might be two possible answers or there might be, well, I would do them both, but the question is about which one would you do first? So um, if you look at this in despair, don't, because I think Hillary, who just took the test, could probably vouch for the fact that questions on the boards are usually tough but fair, I think is the best description. And, and Lindsay, too, since he just took it as well. Yeah, that's a great reminder. I should have mentioned to you guys, I chose these questions. I, I gathered up the 10 or 15 or so questions that mix up respondents missed the most, and then I selected some that for, for interest in variety. So these are these are intended to be hard and don't feel bad if you don't know the answer. That's we're just here to learn. If I if I pick e, if I pick easier questions, you all know the answers and there's nothing to talk about. So all right. Next question. Um, question three. Okay, um, and I'm going to click over to the answers. Okay, I think most folks uh, have their answer in. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll here. All right. Okay, majority of people have chosen answer D with a little bit of a spread between the rest. And those of you who chose that are right um, and you beat out the mix up general population. Um, I picked this question mostly because there's a lot of thyroid and a lot of pregnancy on the, at least on Mixapp. And I thought, I think it's worth reviewing a little bit. I don't know about you guys, but I don't take care of, I, I don't, I take care of zero pregnant patients in my outpatient practice, um, but they show up on the boards a lot. So I thought we could talk a little bit about what happens to thyroid in pregnancy um, and maybe just a little tiny bit about TSH secreting adenoma, which I've never seen, but I bet Dr. Tiley has seen. I've never seen it. It's it's a unicorn. Unicorn. <laughs> Apparently they exist, but I've never seen one. Uh, Mixup has an overrepresentation of, of yes. unicorns. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that, you know, the thing with this question is it, you know, looking at the question stem, there's a lot of the other three answers are clearly wrong, which are probably the more important teaching points, but you're right. There is even on the, the ESAP, the endocrine self-assessment, there's a disproportionate number of pregnancy questions. So it's good for understanding basic thyroid um, physiology. Yeah. Um, does anyone, has anyone taken care of a pregnant patient with hypothyroidism or had, had anything like this come up clinically? No. Dr. Tiley, maybe you would talk us through your approach about about what you would do with a patient in, in that scenario, someone who comes in needs thyroid medication adjustment in pregnancy. Yeah, so one of the things to note with um, this patient is, you know, in pregnant, early pregnancy, there's a lot of thyroid hormone abnormalities. 
So the most common is actually gestational thyroid toxicosis, which is due to the high levels of HCG. HCG cross-reacts at the TSH receptor. So it basically stimulates thyroid hormone production in early pregnancy. So in early pregnancy, your TSH can be a little bit low. Your thyroid hormone levels can be a little bit high. So patients may present with labs consistent with hyperthyroidism. They may not be symptomatic. And in fact, they rarely are symptomatic, but if you're checking thyroid labs in someone who's early in pregnancy, you may see this pattern of hyperthyroidism. That does resolve over the first trimester. So by the second trimester, their thyroid labs are back to normal as the HCG levels go down. So if you're monitoring labs during pregnancy and you happen to notice that someone has very mild hyperthyroidism and they're in their first trimester and they're otherwise feeling well, you don't need to do anything just repeat the levels when they get to their second trimester and they should be better. If they're not, then you have to think about other typical causes of hyperthyroidism. So Graves' disease, again, is gonna be antibodies that stimulate TSH receptors. So you're gonna have that similar pattern of low TSH and high thyroid hormone levels. So A and B would have the same labs. The reason those are the wrong answers here is because in this patient, the TSH was elevated and the thyroid hormone levels were elevated. So she has a high TSH and a high thyroid hormone level. So that is not consistent with hyperthyroidism. If you have a woman who's in early pregnancy and has labs checked and shows that the TSH is elevated, this can also be something that manifests in pregnancy because the um, thyroid hormone demands go up during pregnancy. So there's higher um, levels of binding proteins. And so more of your thyroid hormone is bound to protein, which usually the thyroid will compensate and produce more thyroid hormone. But if someone has underlying like, autoimmune thyroid disease or some other mild thyroid dysfunction, that added stress may be too much and it may not be able to keep up. So you may present with um, subclinical hypothyroidism or overt hypothyroidism in pregnancy. So that's something to monitor for. Um, there's other issues. There's higher um, iodine requirements during pregnancy. So if there's mild iodine deficiency, that may perpetu or, uh, precipitate hypothyroidism during pregnancy. The important thing with hypothyroidism as compared to hyperthyroidism is you do need to treat hypothyroidism as soon as you identify it. So hyperthyroidism, there have been no known negative outcomes with letting someone be mildly hyperthyroid in the first trimester. For hypothyroidism, you need baby needs maternal thyroid hormone for neural development. So it, we try to keep the TSH less than two and the thyroid hormone levels at the high end are slightly above normal during um, pregnancy. So if this patient had a TSH of six, even if they had normal thyroid hormone levels, we'd still want to put them on levothyroxine. Levothyroxine is completely safe during pregnancy, so it's it's fine to give. Um, the one that's tricky about this is the TSH is high and the free T4 is high. So this is not clearly hyperthyroidism, which we could just monitor. It's not clearly hypothyroidism, which we'd want to treat. It's something else. It is probably not a TSH secreting adenoma. The most likely etiology is lab interference. Um, so it's very common to have, particularly people who have underlying autoimmune thyroid disease, have antibodies that interfere with the assays and make your thyroid hormone levels look higher than they actually are. So most likely this is an interfering antibodies. Lab medicine can rerun the assay to help clarify that. Um, probably not a TSH adenoma, but that's what the labs would look like. The other thing it could be would be thyroid hormone resistance, which often is completely asymptomatic too. Um, just have mild TSH elevation, mildly high thyroid hormone level, often have a goiter. Um, so it's most likely a benign entity, but um, with the options you are given for this question, the only possible answer is a TSH secreting adenoma. Nice, that is super helpful. Um, and I, I know that I said I haven't treated very many pregnant patients, but what I will say is that I oftentimes I am the first provider who a patient tells when they've had a positive home pregnancy test. Um, they and it they often don't see OBGYN until late in their first trimester um, or sometimes later. And so 
um, this is the sort of thing that that would come to me to manage first. And all of you, even if you're not going into primary care, you have a panel, you have a residency panel. So um, good to good to know about. Any questions? These okay. are great cases for um, e-consults. So if you have any questions about how to manage these, by the time they get into clinic, they'll be like halfway through the pregnancy. So um, um, these are great e-consult questions. We we like these, they're easy. Excellent. <laughs> Mostly in the chat, um, John mentioned that so other circumstances where you might be asked to address thyroid disease and pregnancy in rural primary care practice, um, or maybe, yep, sometimes uh, addressing pre pregnancy planning for patients mm -hmm. with chronic medications or chronic disease. Yeah. All right. All right. I'm going to bring us forward to question number four. You guys can briefly review here. And I'll bring us to the answers. Okay, it looks like most folks have answers in. Maybe give just a couple more seconds for anyone who wants to get a last minute answer in. All right. I feel like I learn more if I'm forced to actually commit to sending in an answer. You guys <laughs> can do it. All right, I'm going to go ahead and end the poll. Okay. All right. So interesting. So um, you guys did better than mix up on this one also. Um, more than half of you chose hypovitaminosis D, which is the right answer. Um, and there's a little bit of a spread here between answers A and B. Um, anybody who chose answer D, the right answer, willing to talk to us a little bit about that, why you chose that answer? R threes. I can talk about my group. Yeah, yeah I don't know the answer why, but uh, at the VA, we're supposed to uh, check for vitamin D before we start zoledronic acid, and so that's that's my answer. Awesome, good job, John. All right, and that and that is what is going on here. Um, that these bisphosphonates, which I actually haven't started that many of them personally in my in my panel in my practice, but they can precipitate a severe vitamin D deficiency. Have you seen that in John? Or are you just you're doing your routine checking? Uh, no, uh, uh, pharmacy will not let me start it without mm -hmm. that lab level. Nice. So thank you, pharmacy. Good Swiss cheese model. <laughs> yeah. You also can't refer to osteoporosis clinic at the VA without a vitamin D level. Nice. Good job, VA. Okay. For those of us who don't have pharmacists reviewing all of our meds and uh, monitor ourselves, this is a good reminder to me to always check a vitamin D before I start. Um, Dr. Tell, you want to tell us a little more about the physiology? Yeah. So if you think about calcium physiology, so you need vitamin D to absorb calcium from the gut. So you can be taking all the calcium you need through your diet, but if you have no vitamin D, your calcium absorption from the gut is going to be very, very low. So in cases of severe vitamin D deficiency, the vast majority of the calcium in your blood is coming from your bones. You take a bisphosphonate, 
you shut down bone turnover. So it decreases the availability of calcium from the bones, but you can't get it from anywhere else because your vitamin D level is too low to get it from the diet. So it precipitates hypocalcemia because you have now shut down your only source of calcium when you have low vitamin D. So you wanna make sure that patients have our vitamin D replete before giving um, bisphosphonates. And actually we've seen this in the hospital in patients who are being treated with bisphosphonate for hypercalcemia, that if they're severely vitamin D deficient, we, over, we end up overshooting because the calcium drops and then just keeps on going. So it is important to make sure that they have adequate vitamin D so that they're gonna be able to absorb calcium. Um, can we go back to the question, Stem? Yeah. Can I ask you what you mean by adequate vitamin D? Uh, 20, <laughs> just not five. You know, it, it doesn't need to be great. It just can't be like five or two or something. So I think 20 is adequate. Do they need to be on a supplement, like a daily supplement also? I do. I usually have people who are on bisphosphonates taking daily calcium and vitamin D. Just They should have 12 to 1500 milligrams of calcium. And I usually have them take 1000 to 2000 vitamin D a day just to make sure. Um, so the other question, was, the other answer that people chose was hungry bone syndrome. So just the hungry bone syndrome is really only seen after surgery for tertiary hyperparathyroidism. So what happens there is you've got um, these high parathyroid hormone levels that are um, um, just, and when the parathyroid glands are gone, the body is trying to get calcium from other places and it can, it, it just drops really quick. So I'm explaining the physiology of that horribly because it's renal and I'm not that great with renal, but I can say that you're not gonna get hungry bone syndrome unless you remove someone's parathyroid glands. So that's not really a clinical scenario that would be relevant in this case. And that answer choice, hungry bone syndrome, shows up a lot as a red herring on these mix-up questions. Yeah, so just associate hungry bone syndrome with end-stage renal disease and tertiary hyperparathyroidism. So if someone has normal renal function, has normal parathyroid hormone levels, has not had the parathyroid surgery, you're not going to get hungry bone syndrome. You can get um, hypo hypocalcemia following you know, thyroid surgery because the parathyroid glands inadvertently get removed. That's much more common would present very similarly, but they'd have a history of patient just had surgery for a goiter. Um, okay, so for, so mix up learning point is hungry bone syndrome is associated with hypoparathyroid or with um, parathyroid removal surgery. And in clinical practice, we wanna be like the VA and always measure a vitamin D before we be start like this the VA. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> Not something I say that often here at Belltown, but you know, I'll take the opportunity. All right. Um, any any other questions about or or comments about this question before we move on? Is it also like do you have to do the oral bisphosphonate and check vitamin D also? I do. Um, it's it's you know because they need vitamin D to absorb the calcium that they're going to need for bone health anyway. So I always check vitamin D and calcium. Really, you need it before denosumab as well because denosumab works similar, I mean, it's a different mechanism than bisphosphonates, but it blocks bone turnover. So um, it's a similar side effect profile. So you need to check calcium and vitamin D before starting the bisphosphonates or denosumab. And then with um, teriparatide, you just need to make sure they don't have elevated parathyroid hormone levels because it's a PTH analog. So in general, if you're referring someone for bone issues, you should have a calcium and a vitamin D because that's part of the bone health. You really need to have those as part of the workup for um, osteoporosis. Right. And if I can ask too, when you have someone who's already on a bisphosphonate, do you do any sort of interval like annual screening of vitamin D or cal uh, calcium? Not if they have a history of low vitamin D in the past, I might do it. What you'll run into is just a logistical challenge is for your patients on Medicare, 
you're going to get this stupid alert in Epic that won't let you order a vitamin D unless you have the right diagnostic thing. I can't order a DEXA scan for hyperthyroid patients because Medicare does not believe that that is an adequate reason for ordering a DEXA scan. And it very much is a reason for ordering a DEXA scan because hyperthyroidism can cause osteoporosis. Um, so you have to have, so I really only order it in people with a history of vitamin D deficiency because then it's a lot easier to justify it to, I don't know, apparently vitamin D is really expensive to measure. They're very stingy with that test. Um, but if someone has no history of vitamin D deficiency, it's very unlikely that they're going to develop it unless they suddenly develop a new malabsorptive disorder or stop leaving their house or something changes. And then I would, but routinely only if they have a history of it or are not taking a supplement, if they're taking a supplement, they should be fine. Okay. Or if they take my advice about sunscreen too seriously, all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. I'm going to move us forward here. Question five. We'll review it briefly. Okay. Okay, I think most folks have answered. Go ahead and close the poll. A few more trickle in. Okay, we'll close the poll. <laughs> All right. Okay, we have quite a spread on this one too. Um, only a third of the general mix up respondents got this one right. Um, a lot of folks here have answered answer question or answer choice D about DHEAS measurement. And we also have a, a lot of spread on urine-free cortisol. I don't know about you guys, but I end up seeing stuff like this in my inbox with some regularity that there's an adrenal incidental ona. This also is something that could come up inpatient, get a lot of inpatient CT abdomen pelvises and something like this has to be noted and addressed either inpatient or deferred PCP uh, for management. Um, all right. So um, when I'm looking at these, I think these are my two, maybe my first main question is, does this look benign or does this look malignant? And I've sent endocrinology e-consults for this. Maybe Dr. Charlie, you can talk us through your thought process with these. No, I mean, this is exactly the same thought process we have. I mean, the first thing is incidentalomas are incredibly common, especially on patients who are admitted for something, get scanned, and then they defer follow-up. They're not very good at following up incidentalomas in the hospital. Um, and these often get passed on to the primary care doctors. And you have to know that they're there. Unless you're looking at their inpatient imaging, you may not know that this was found. So they're very common. Um, the first question is, is this more likely to be benign and malignant? And the imaging characteristics are really what we're looking at there. Radiology is usually pretty good about putting in their um, impression, whether this is consistent with a benign adenoma. So what they're looking at is size. So most benign adenomas never get bigger than three, four centimeters. Um, uh, like any tumor, if it's got nice round borders, it's, it's a more likely to be a benign tumor. The thing that they really use for differentiating is something called Hounsfield units, which is non-contrast 
um, density, essentially, of the nodules. So fatty, benign tumors tend to have low Hounsfeld units. Malignant tumors tend to have, and pheochromocytomas fall into the malignant tumor category. Those tend to have higher Hounsfeld units. The other part they look at is contrast washout. So really to evaluate an adrenal adenoma, you need a triple phase CT. So they do non-cron, they do contrast, and then they do post-contrast. And they're not normally going to get that unless the CT scan was specifically to evaluate an adrenal adenoma. So you're going to have partial information when you first get this. And the first step should be to get an adrenal protocol CT to get full information because contrast washout is also part of it. Benign adenomas clear contrast very quickly. Malignancies are going to hold on to contrast more longer, more longer, longer, and um, was another characteristic. So I think in this case, they described high Hounsfield units. Um, I actually abstained from answering this question because I didn't like any of the answer choices. <laughs> and, um, I see now what they were getting at. So it was had Hounsfield units of 21, which is very indeterminate. And this falls into the, this is not a clear cut case. And there are actually a lot of right answers for the next step. So. This could be benign, this could be malignant. So that's, we don't know after this first stop. Um, so the next step is, is it functioning? So benign no nodules can be functional, malignancies can be functional as well. Adrenal cortical carcinomas can secrete cortisol and androgens, pheochromocytomas secrete metanephrine. So regardless of whether you think it's benign or malignant, you have to evaluate for functionality. The only one you wouldn't test for if you thought this was a malignancy was aldosterone because malignancies just don't produce aldosterone. If the patient does not have hypertension, you do not need to test for aldosterone because that's really the only thing we care about with elevated aldosterone is hypertension and hypokalemia, but that's actually less common than you would be led to believe. So in this case, the correct answer would be to screen for functionality. And that would be to look for pheochromocytoma, look for um, Cushing's, and then probably I would look for adrenal androgens as well if I were worried about a malignancy. A lot of it's going to depend on the patient's uh, clinical presentation. So what I would do in this case is you get a 24-hour urine, but you're going to get metanephrines and cortisol because you're doing one 24-hour urine. You should just measure both of those. And I think those were both options. Yeah, so B yeah. and A, you're going to do it exactly the same time, and they both need to be done. Um, there's nothing specific about this imaging that makes you think pheo. It could very well be adrenal cortical carcinoma. So, um, yeah, so I didn't like that question. But the teaching points are, look, you want to know the features of um, malignant versus benign on imaging. And it's usually gonna be Hounsfield units, low for benign, high for malignant, contrast washout fast for benign, slow for malignant. Anything over four centimeters should see a surgeon. Then you wanna get labs. If they have hypertension, you can evaluate for um, elevated aldosterone. That's the easiest one because it's just a blood test. Then VO, Cushing's. And if there's any suggestion of hirsutism, I'll check a DHEA. Um, because that may be elevated with um, adrenal cortical carcinoma. For ruling out Cushing's, you really can do any number of tests. Um, it, it really depends on where you're coming at this nodule from. A true incidentaloma, I usually do a dexamethasone suppression test, especially if I'm not worried about a pheo. If you're already doing the 24-hour urine collection, just do it for both. Um, sometimes we do midnight salivary cortisol, but that depends on normal circadian rhythms, which can be hard to predict in some people. So I don't think you would have been wrong if you had selected A. I don't think you were wrong for selecting B. Hyperaldosterone would not have been, ah, I got kicked out again. Did I? No, I'm still there. No, Sorry. You're still here. <laughs> My husband's using all of our bandwidth and I get kicked <laughs> off periodically. Um, so, um, and I don't remember what the other answer choices were. Yeah, so A, B, and C, I would have done all at the same time because they're all appropriate to evaluate when you're worried about an adrenal malignancy. Mm -hmm. I guess FIO is the most likely to kill you quickly. So maybe that's why you choose that one first, but I don't 
think any of them are better than any others other than C because she was not hypertensive. So you don't need to check right. for hyperaldosterone. Right. And she's not, and there's no mention of hirsutism here. Yeah. So they're implying that she's not. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think part of the takeaway with this question is adrenal incidentaloma is something to put on the problem list, put in your discharge summary. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so that somebody, hi, it's me, can follow that up later. Because if I don't know it's there, then I, I can't follow it up. Um, and then also just sort of a, a brief review, so like overview, sort of what are we looking for? Is it malignant? Is it functioning? And how do you begin to go about that? This can get really complicated. I, like I said, I've sent, I have sent endo e-consults. These this. are great <laughs> e-consults too, because yeah. these are so, they're very, I mean, this is, all we do are like these protocols, like if this, then do that. And so these are really easy things for us to just put in the e-consult to walk you through the steps and some of the nuances, because there are some nuances to these, you know, if someone's on oral contraceptives, it throws off your 24 hour urine collection. Like there's all these, well, it doesn't it throws off your dexamethasone suppression test, but so there's nuances um, and we love this stuff. So right. <laughs> we're happy to do these. And as far as the, as Mixap goes, rule out the thing that'll kill you, which could be a FIO if it seems. Yes. Like, yeah. The FIO actually, you know, is very important to rule out but before surgery, you still need to rule out hypercortisolism because post-op adrenal insufficiency is, is real if you take out a cortisol-producing tumor and aren't prepared for that because the other gland is, is suppressed. Yeah. As we're moving on to the next question, I just want to um, check in time-wise. I think we maybe have, have about five minutes for um, the next question, and then maybe if there are ling lingering questions folks can ask during the break. Does that sound okay? Dr. Iskin and Dr. Tiley. Yeah, it works for me. Works for me. Sorry, I talk about I, not mm -hmm. this stuff. I told you I could talk about yeah. endocrine evaluations all day long and board questions in particular. Mm -hmm. I I love the logic of them and the illogic of them sometimes. So this is great. This is like pure gold <laughs> coming down to us. I love it. Yeah, we appreciate um, your pearls. Yeah. All right, team. Last question, and then you'll be free of me. <laughs> I feel like I see a lot of patients. Like I've seen a few patients in clinic like this recently. All right, I'm gonna go over to the answer choices here. I think I see a few more trickling in. Give maybe about 10 more seconds. Okay, you can go ahead and share. All right. So most of you chose answer choice A, which is the cosyntropin stimulation test. Um, Mixap would have you choose answer choice B, which is the 21 hydroxylase <laughs> antibody measurement. I've never ordered that test before. Um, I would argue that the correct answer is not actually up here. So. What would you have <laughs> us do? <laughs> um, so what would the, go back to the question. Yeah. All right. So we've got, um, orthostasis. He's got uh, elevated potassium, high ACTH, low morning cortisol. So what does everyone think is going on with this guy? Where's the problem? Adrenal insufficiency. Yeah, so his adrenal glands aren't working and we don't know why. So you need to look at the adrenal glands. So I would get a CT abdomen in this person. Um, I don't care what his antibodies are, you know, <laughs> I mean, 
what they're getting at is you don't necessarily need the cocentropin stimulation test because it's pretty clear cut adrenal insufficiency with the markedly elevated ACTH, the low morning cortisol. I would argue that that morning cortisol should be a little bit lower for me to feel comfortable not doing the ACTH stimulation test. I'd probably still do it just to make myself feel better. So I agree that that would be my answer here. Um, but he clearly has primary adrenal insufficiency. And the most common cause of that in the United States is autoimmune adrenal insufficiency. So you would get the antibody testing, but I wouldn't bother with the antibody testing. I would just get the CT scan because if the CT is normal, then you're okay. And you just treat for adrenal insufficiency. You don't need the antibodies as part of your evaluation. So you want to make sure that there's not something else going on like infection. So TB is the most common cause of primary adrenal insufficiency worldwide because it infiltrates the adrenal glands. Malignancy, it's a very common location for metastases. Um, there's um, other rare causes of adrenal insufficiency with some of the um, uh, fatty acid metabolism type um, disorders, metabolic, congenital metabolic disorders, but those all present with big adrenal glands. They're going to look abnormal. So if you have a normal CT, you just assume they have autoimmune adrenal insufficiency and treat accordingly. Don't waste your money on the antibody testing. Nice. Mixup doesn't want us to order any CTs. Never, but you're going to do it. Yeah, so. we're going to give it. This one is showing uh, infection-related adrenal hemorrhage here, yep. um, which could cause adrenal insufficiency. Yeah. Um, and so your primary test, when you're when you're evaluating somebody for adrenal insufficiency in clinic, you first get the fast or the morning cortisol, and then usually I'll just jump to the cocentropin stimulation test. I mean, we can do it okay. in clinic. Nick. So yeah. if someone's referred to us for adrenal insufficiency, we just do it yeah. while they're there um, and rules it out. The morning one, if it's less than two, it's pretty diagnostic, but random cortisols are not terribly useful in diagnosing adrenal insufficiency. So I just do the cocentropin stimulation test. And yeah. usually my index of suspicion is pretty low and I'm just doing it to prove to them that their adrenal glands are working fine. Nice. Gotcha. Good. The benefit of endocrine clinic, you guys can do that there. We Yes. We do not have an easy way to do that in my clinic. So I often end up ordering these morning cortisols as the initial attempt. But. So we can do the stimulation test as a nurse visit. So if you do mm. an e-consult, we can help arrange that without them having to do an in-person endocrine consult. So Good if to know. you want one, we can tell you if we agree. And if we agree, we can do a nurse visit. Good to know. All right. Like that. All right, guys, um, I know I want you to, I want to make sure that you get your break. So I'm not going to encroach on that time too much further. I put out here um, a few of the pearls that Mixapp and I thought about, and Dr. Tiley can can give us some of her pearls too. But um, if you have an elevated prolactin, you need to rule out a prolactinoma with a pituitary MRI. In most of your hospitalized patients, you're gonna to wanna to use a basal bolus regimen so as to not rely too much on a reactive insulin strategy. That the normal pattern of hyperthyroidism is a suppressed TSH with an elevated T4. That we should be like the VA and measure vitamin D routinely before starting bisphosphonate therapy. And I actually think I'm gonna make a little order panel for that so that I don't ever forget it. Um, and then when you find your adrenal incidentaloma, you need to follow the protocol. Number one, make sure it's not malignant. Number two, make sure it's not producing hormones. And that a low serum cortisol with an elevated ACTH indicates primary adrenal insufficiency, which you can also evaluate with a cocentropin stim test. Yeah. Right. Those are all excellent teaching points, although they went about it a little strangely, but that's that's mix up. <laughs> so. That's mix up, yeah. <laughs> Um, thank you both so much. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Hillary Iskin and Dr. Tracy Kiley for those pearls. Um, why don't we take a 10 minute break and come back at 1040, um, for Dr. Celia Hearings, um, talk, uh, and maybe, um, Dr. Tiley and Dr. Iskin, if folks have any questions, do you mind hanging on just for a few more minutes and, um, yep. make okay. Sounds good. I have some endocrine questions that are not related that I'm like trying to hold back. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Can you tell that half these questions I picked because I have my own agenda for my patients? <laughs> <laughs> Tracy, that was great. Thank you so much. That was sure. That was I'm just always happy to, to talk endocrine. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Hashtag asking for a friend. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Maybe everybody went on their break. I mean, if you're okay with me asking, some go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, osteonecrosis of the jaw related to this phosphonate therapy. Yes. After somebody has been off of it for a year, but was on mm -hmm. it for like 12 years, mm -hmm. is there any change? and how you think about it. I don't think so. I mean, I don't really think about it that much, to be honest. I worry about it more in patients who are on it for cancer, you mm. know, because they're getting such higher doses. The oral bisphosphonates, it, it happens, but not at any number that would be worth worrying about. You're more likely to break a hip from osteoporosis than you are to get osteonecrosis of the jaw. You're more likely to get yeah. an osteoporotic fracture than an atypical femur fracture. So, you know, it's, it decreases your risk of uh, osteoporotic fracture so significantly that I try to not worry as much about the other. So when someone's on bisphosphonates, I don't worry too much about having them hold it for any dental work. Sometimes patients want to because they're nervous about it. And it's fine because the effect on the bone lasts for years, five, 10 years. And so taking a break from their bisphosphonate to get their dental work done, it's very reasonable. So a patient's going to hold it for a year to get some extensive dental work done. And it's, it's fine. Denosumab also has a risk of osteonecrosis of the jaw again, because it's the same mechanism, relatively same mechanism of action. Um, the thing with denosumab though, is if you stop it, you lose all gains within six months. So you cannot stop denosumab without starting something else. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so I don't think about the osteonecrosis being, I mean, once the bisphosphonate stopped, it stopped. And if they need dental work, they need dental work. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I, I maybe am not worried about it as much as I should, but I've just, I've never seen it. Yeah. And I've seen a lot of osteoporotic fractures. So I worry more about that than that was makes sense. I had like a, a dental, a dentist reach out to me about like needing a, like a medical consultation before this patient could get yeah. dental for like a tooth infection. Um, that is interesting. I mean, most of the things can't be, you can't wait. It's not like we're going to wait five years for the bisphosphonate to get out of the bones before you to your, your abscess tooth. It's, mm -hmm. it's you just monitor hope for the best. Yeah. Yeah. And then my second endocrine, second and last endocrine related question <laughs> is related to hyperparathyroidism. So um, for a patient I just saw in clinic who had hypercalcemia, like 10.3, 10.1, 10.4 over the last couple of years and mm -hmm. PTH in like the 120s. And mm -hmm. then I checked her vitamin D level and it was like 15. Well, I haven't done the 24 hour year in calcium yet. Is there any utility to correcting her vitamin the deficiency before doing the 24 hour year in calcium versus just doing um, the urine calcium? So I don't always do the 24 hour urine okay. calcium. Um, it depends on sort of other, it, how old is the patient? Uh, I think she's in her like 50, 60, 60, okay. 64. That's right. She's 64. Cause she hadn't quite had a DEXA yet. Okay. Yeah. And so then you try to get a DEXA to evaluate for hyperparathyroid and Medicare is going to say, or your insurance is going to kick back and say no, but anyway. Um, so what I would do in this case is because she has elevated calcium and elevated PTH, you don't usually get an elevated calcium with secondary hyperparathyroidism. So for PTH or elevated because of her vitamin D deficiency, you don't usually see hypercalcemia. Right. I would replace her vitamin D like with not with high dose, but like one to 2000 a day, but I wouldn't necessarily have that hold up your workup. Yeah. The question is whether she would need surgery for mm -hmm. her hyperparathyroidism. If she's asymptomatic mm -hmm. and she does not have osteoporosis and she has mm -hmm. no history 
of kidney stones mm -hmm. um, and she's not excited about surgery, then I don't worry about the 24 hour urine collection. If you want mm -hmm. a reason to send them to surgery, then a high urine calcium can do it. In which case you do want the vitamin D replaced because your urine calcium will be low mm -hmm. with low vitamin D. It's better mm -hmm. with high vitamin D. But I don't find the urine calcium is very helpful because it depends a lot on dietary intake. Mm -hmm. It usually comes in around 200. I'm like, is that low? Is that high? I don't know. Um, but if they have other reasons for going to surgery and you're going to treat them anyway, I don't, I don't worry about it. I wouldn't do imaging unless she's going to go to surgery. Um, but if you do want to do a 24 hour urine, I would probably get the calcium or vitamin D up a little bit before doing it. Thank you. I really appreciate that perspective and the <laughs> personal consults. <laughs> but hopefully other folks uh, learn some things from that too. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. Awesome. All Thank right. You I think so much for yeah. Yeah. My Happy pleasure. To do it. Yeah. All right. Back to clinic. All right. Thanks. Bye. Bye, Dr. Bye. Bye, Dr. Tylee. Bye.